Hello, you're welcome. You're welcome onto my channel today, and it gives me great joy to observe you are viewing this video. I'm Professor Olayeka Kale. I'm a lecturer in the university. On this channel, I do a number of thoughts, but all these thoughts I do, sociology, research, are very central to them. So the video you are viewing today is within my playlist or my playlist of uh, sociology. Meanwhile, if you have not subscribed to this channel, kindly go ahead and click subscribe on your screen right now to join my family of subscribers. And so that you might be alerted every time I drop new video. The title of this video is Falsification. Falsification. Falsification and theory. Falsification and science. Philosophy of science. So falsification is a very important um, issue you know, in, 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 in sociology and even in research, because theory is very central to research, just like research is central to theory. I usually use the metaf a metaphor of anchor and navigation tools, that theory can be a navigation tool for research and research can be an anchor, you know, to a ship or, or you know, the water. So they are very related. So that's why I want you to view this video to the end to see what falsification is. It doesn't mean falsification like a, you know a fraudulent act like an everyday experience. It's a strong issue. Some will say strong philosophy, a strong concept, a strong idea within the confine of philosophy of science. And that's why Karpopa is very central. Karpopa you know, is mostly regarded as a philosopher of science or science philosopher who try to you know question the philosophical basis of what of all that we do in science uh, and for Popper, for Karl Popper, falsification is the actual element that gives that, that gives science its scientific identity falsification is essentially the idea the concept the philosophy the orientation that, distinct, that distinguishes science from pseudo-sciences, or that distinguishes science from common sense experience. So we have to take falsification seriously. We have to take falsification seriously because it enables us to have critical, open-minded open approach you know, to research and science. When you think within the broader framework of falsification, it teaches, it teaches you to be critical, to be open-minded, to be receptive, you know, to hide us, to be receptive to criticism, and to want to do more, to want to do more rather than seeking validation. You see, and that is why, you know, falsification is a scientific principle, essentially speaking, and it's within the framework of philosophy of science, which essentially means, you know, examine every theory, examine every hypothesis, to test that they are, they are valid, to test they are true and correct. Being open. So essentially, we, we can say, what is falsification? Then falsification can be, can be regarded within the framework of philosophy of science as the, the belief that a theory, the philosophical belief, philosophical conviction, philosophical orientation, that every theory, every hypothesis, must be able to be to be to be proven to be tested and proven to be false tested to be false to be regarded as a scientific the principle that a theory every theory if the principle that every hypothesis must be able to be proven to be false for us to regard that theory that hypothesis as scientific any idea, any, any theory, any hypothesis that is not able to be subjected to critical analysis, critical evaluation, critical uh, I know, analysis to be testable. So for a theory to be regarded as a theory, it must be testable. It must be examinable and must be able to be proven to be false before we can say that theory is scientific. View my video on perspective. View my video on paradigm. You know, view my video, you know, on, on, on theory, how best to understand theory. 
view my video on all of this, we understand where we're coming from. So I'm in philosophy of science now, and I'm dealing with falsification today. Because many scientists simply think, if I propound a theory, if I test that hypothesis, my hypothesis must always be true. My theory must always be seen to be correct. No! Actually, what makes a theory scientific or an hypothesis scientific is the capacity of that theory, capacity of your research, capacity of your findings, capacity of your, or, or, you know, of your methodology, of your hypothesis, of your objective to be proven to be false. So if you work from this orientation, from this mindset, from this frame of mind, then you are very open. So the openness to criticism, to examination, is actually what makes your work to be scientific. So if you just do a research, you propound the theory, and you just, all you are doing is just to be able to prove that it's true all the time. It must be true all the time. Then you are not a scientist. So from the perspective of falsification, the capacity of that theory, your hypothesis, your work, your research, to be testable and to be able to be proven to be false is actually what makes it scientific. Is it not? Oh wow, this is very interesting. Because people just think is when my research is confirmed that is scientific. Philosophically, that's not true. Working from that orientation is very important. You also, you, so your theory must be able to be evaluated and proven. So that's why we, now we don't so much uh, uh, appreciate what we call Hampshire theorizing. You just sit in a place, you just theorize it. You just theorize it. No, God, no, that's far gone with the era of Karl Marx. Weber tried. Emil Durkheim, Durkheim I also tried when they introduced the study of suicide. Uh, Durkheim introduced the study of suicide and anomie and encouraged her to, do, to embrace empiricism, positivism, to gather data as things, sweet generis. Wonderful. Durkheim. You know, and Weber, you know, you know, also introduced in the study of society and in, in Protestant ethics uh, uh, and the spirit of capitalism. Got that data all over. Also in his work on bureaucracy, get that data all over. And these were issues that were engaged over a period of time. So there must you know the stability of the theory to be amenable to, to being tested and to be made possible to be proven false, to be proven untrue, you know, is actually what makes that work very, very scientific. And this is very central to the work of Karl Popper, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a, a philosopher of science, a science philosopher, you know, and for Popper, the only way for science to progress is only true, you know, only, science can only progress. For science to progress, there must be capacity to be to falsify theory and researches. So the scientific progress is only possible through the, the, the process of attempting to, dis, to, know, to disprove that theory, to, to, to know capacity to be able to, to falsify theory or scientific processes. So this is only when science can progress. You know, science is cumulative. Yeah, and if you look at the work of Thomas Kuhn, the, the, you know, the structure of scientific revolution. So it's only revolutionary ideas, destructive ideas, you know, radical innovations in theory, you know, uh, you, you know, radical innovations in theory, radical falsification of theories, you know, disruptions in theoretical orientations. These are very important and we must be open to this. So if you look at the work of Kuhn in the structural scientific revolution, is the capacity, and you take this in zinc with the work of Karl Popper on falsification, you will see that knowledge is cumulative and until one knowledge is is, is, is proven to be to be untrue, proven to be incorrect, you know, proven to be false, then we cannot begin to have scientific revolution that will lead us into progress. So the scientific progress is only going to be possible through, the, the, you know, the process of attempting to always prove invalidate theories until we are open to this and able to work to, and this is very important because you see sometimes Students take theories to the field, and all they come back with is to begin to use the same theory to explain their findings out of context of that theory. Students, even in such a simple thing, sometimes you have your theories must continually be validated, conform, your findings must conform to the theory that is going to explain it. No! As far as a student, you know, some times ago, and the student essentially won so many awards, you know, won a very fantastic award. And this is a student that was open enough to engage me for over one hour to be able to, 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 to tell me that the theory he went to the field with 
you know, eventually could not explain his findings. I said, okay, develop one. Let's move on to grounded theory. It doesn't mean your theory that you proposed must be able to explain your work. No, that's not the way it works. The way it works is for to you propose that theory. When you come back from the field, that theory must have been tested, probably to be untrue or must be revised or utterly rejected to because it's been proven to be untrue. Then you develop a new theory or you lose that theory. To, so no, there should be no struggles to justify or confirm theory. It's to ask questions from there. And it should not be about confirmation. So, you know, theories must be open to falsification, not unnecessary struggle, you know, to, 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 to confirm, to validate. Even when you see, should, because scientific theories should make specific testable predictions. Theories must make, don't forget this, Theories, scientific theory, theory that have been regarded as scientific, must make specific testable predictions that can be can, that can be that can be subjected to analysis. So once they make specific testable predict, predictions, then it means we can test those predictions across contexts. And it doesn't mean that they must be they must be valid or true in every context. In some contexts, they might not work. You develop a theory in the US. In Canada, and you are bringing the same theory to to Ghana, to Mauritius, to to Mexico, and you think the theory must be always be true? Yeah, it may be true in many contexts, but we must also be open enough to be to, to know that it may not be true. It may be falsified. Maybe based on concepts, time, experiences, or issues, or so many other reasons. So there's no need to struggle to 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 validate theory, to confirm theory. What we need to learn is to be hopeful, to be able to test that theory and ask questions from the theory. So, and there's no theory that should not be testable. Any theory that is just bogus without specific testable variables is not scientific. The predictions, propositions of the theory must be also be very clear. So, if, 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 you, if a theory is contradicted by evidence, then that theory is proven false. That is, is falsified. That's what falsification means. <laughs> Let's listen to that. So, if theories are contradicted by evidence, then that theory is falsified. That means that theory is proven false. Maybe at that time, maybe within that context, maybe within that experience, maybe because of the data. So, that's what it means. And even if not falsified, if there are theories that are not falsified, they are accepted, to be valid, that does not mean that theory is indefinitely, infinitely true. They may only be confirmed in that scenario, in that in that context. So if we, if a theory is not falsified uh, or is not di disproven, it does mean that theory is accepted at that point in time. And don't forget, it's accepted not indefinitely, but it's accepted to be not to be disproven until. It is eventually disproven. Do you see the trajectory? That means the theory is not disproven, it's not falsified. That does not mean it is definitively, ultimately, permanently, you know, taken to be to be true. But it just means it's professionally accepted at that point in time, in that experience, until it is ultimately disproven, ultimately falsified. What does that mean? It means we must continuously test theories. Critically test theory. If it's accepted today, it doesn't mean that it's accepted forever. That means it's provisionally accepted and the examination of value or critical analysis of the theory continues with the mindset that ultimately it may be disproven one day. Then that's the only way science can progress. So we have to be critical rather than just being confirmative. Science is about critical analysis, critical thinking. Science is about innovation. As I'm making this video, I'm in an international, international meeting of scholars far away from my country. But and I, I just presented a paper yesterday to them about the role, the importance of critical thinking and innovation in research, in, in, you know, even in supervision. I presented the paper to them. So we have to be critically minded. Critical thinking will lead to innovation that may be destructive, that may be radical, and that may, that may be cumulative. So we, this is the essence of science, constantly asking questions. According to science, questions, not answers, bring solution, bring, con bring progress, scientifically speaking. What about that? Quite intriguing, interesting. 
So we have to constantly ask questions. The day we stop asking questions and just become, start confirming, then science has lost its science. It has become pseudoscience. So critical approach and falsification is are very, these are the essence, uh, the, the, these are the main ingredients that makes science, science. Critical approach, you know, and attempt at falsification or ultimate falsification. They are the main identities of science. Otherwise, science becomes pseudoscience, you know. Then I need to talk about, as I want to round up, I need to talk about falsification and validation. They are different. So validation simply means theory can be considered true, true just through observation. That theories can be considered true merely by observation. Papa said, no, it's more than that. If that is fine, it should be the other way around. That theories can be true, you know, can, theories can be proven false through observation. Federation says theories, theories can be proven, you know, um, when you look at the difference, I'm trying to draw the difference between, you know, falsification and validation. Validation, we, we say, or says, theories can be proven true by observation. Popper said no. Theories can actually be proven false by observation. What does that mean? It's not the truism of a theory that should be our preoccupation. But the, 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 the tendency to, for the theory to be, to be incorrect, to be untrue, to be false, should be our, so our orientation as scientists. That's why scientists must not be interested in validation. Rather, scientists should be interested in falsification so that we can continue to engage in critical analysis until we get to ultimate science. Again, revolution can take place when it's seen to be false by falsification. Then science continues to move cumulatively. So falsification, for, you know, for science to, to, be, to remain competitive and relevant science, then falsification should be the ultimate goal to continue to ask questions. Unfortunately, in today's scholarship, people just think, well, even when you are trying to establish, criti you know, engage in critical analysis of their theories or other things, they think you are just their enemies. They think you are dragging them down. Dad, no, scientists don't think like that. They say somebody is a quack, you know, or, or an imposter. So the real scientists are open to criticism, critical engagement, or true open-minded approach. So falsification for science is central as against pseudoscience. Till I see you in my next video, bye for now and click subscribe.